This podcast is not meant to be professional advice of any kind. It is meant to be informative and entertaining. If you make any changes to your life, see the appropriate professional before you do so. Welcome to Super Age. My name is David Stewart. I am the founder of Ageist and your host on the Super Age show. We talk about how to live healthier, how to live longer, and how to be happier. And who doesn't want that? Today's show is brought to you by Inside Tracker, the dashboard to your inner health. Go to insidetracker.com slash ages, save 20% on all their products. Today's show is also brought to you by SRW. Aging is inevitable, but how we age is chiefly a matter of our choices. If you go to srw.co, you can save 20% on all their products by using the code AGEST20 at checkout. Welcome to the Super Age Show. This is going to be dropping on February the 23rd, 2023, and this is episode 122. This week, I'm coming to you from the lovely state of Utah. I'm back here for about 10 days after two weeks in Manhattan, and I got to say, I really like this binary lifestyle. I don't know. I'm Maybe I'm just hard to please. I don't know. <laughs> But I really love being in New York. I love seeing my friends there, and I love all the energy that New York gives off. But, you know, there's only so much energy that one can absorb. So I'm back here in Utah for a little bit. I've been skiing and back in class seeing all the gang from my ski class, which I have have missed. And I've missed being on the mountain. I've missed my coaches. and I've missed skiing. And so I'm, I'm here for a little bit, and then next week I'll be back in New York for a couple of weeks. And there's something about the, the rhythm of this. The New York sort of is, I, I guess, it, to put it back into like a human biology sensibility, New York would be the full-on sympathetic, and Utah would be a little bit more of the parasympathetic. So it's sort of like breathing in, breathing out, this rhythm of on and off, expand, contract, um, rest, digest, however far you want to take this, yin-yang. Um, but th- th- there's something really lovely about it. And I have read that Carl Jung did something similar. Not that I'm Carl Jung, but um, he, you know, he did a lot of, he, he was a very social guy. Um, and I, I think he was living in, I want to say Zurich. Um, and then he would do that for a couple of weeks. And then he would just go out to the country and he would hang out there for a couple of weeks. And I, I have some recollection from college that I think David Thoreau of Walden um, did something similar. He was involved in cosmopolitan Boston life, and then he would go out to Walden, and in his case, I think he just walked there, and he would hang out there for a little bit. But there's there's something sort of nice about this. I, You know, it's not for everyone. There's considerable disruption when this happens. You get airplanes, and did I pack all the right stuff? And oh my gosh, I forgot XYZ charger. Um, but all in all, it's it's kind of great. You you know the best of both worlds. So I like that, um, and I I find that I smile a lot. Um, I think that I smile because I look forward to going back to New York and seeing all of that, and I smile when I'm here in Utah because it's just incredibly beautiful. And you know, in no one place do I feel trapped because I know I'm going to be in the other place soon. So. That that works for me. I don't know. What is it? Do you, do you guys, do you know anybody who does this sort of thing? Um, is it something that you would want to do? I don't know. Let me know. Um, it, just in case you don't know, my email is davidsuperage.com. Hit me up. Today's show is brought to you by SRW Laboratories. Out of New Zealand, their vision is to extend human health span. SRW Labs curates the very latest in science and research to formulate premium nutraceuticals that support your cellular health especially as you age. Working with their scientific advisory board, they seek to understand and address the causes of aging at a cellular level, providing support across 12 bodily systems with an approach that is unique to SRW. They know that doing one thing well, such as eating healthily, won't have the desired effect on your health. This is why SRW seeks to educate people on the factors that influence aging and, more importantly, biological age. Use the code AGEST20 at checkout and save 20% off any order. Go to srw.co, .co, not .com. Use the code AGEST20 at checkout, save 20% on all their products. 
Today on the show, we've got Dr. Vonda Wright. And we had Dr. Vonda on, I think, a couple of years ago. She was one of the first folks we had on this show. She's, um, a, she's an orthopedics uh, doctor. She deals with bones and, and skeletal issues. Um, and she has a, also expertise in sports medicine. So we're going to talk a little bit about muscular skeletal aging and how that affects longevity. And then we're going, to, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the other parts of that, how hormones affect that, glucose. And then um, she has some interesting things to say about alcohol, um, which we're hearing more and more about. Um, so she's, um, it, this is a, a great conversation. I love having Dr. Vonda on the show. We're very much aligned with how we feel about a lot of things that are going on in medicine and a lot of things that we can do to increase if not our lifespan, um, definitely our health span. So we're going to get with Dr. Vonda Wright in just a moment after a quick word from our sponsor. Hey, today's show is also brought to you by Inside Tracker, the dashboard to your inner health. My car's got a speedometer. It's got a gas gauge. It's got all these indicator lights on it. It lets me know what's going on inside the car so I don't get any kind of surprises. So if something comes up, I can take some kind of action on it. Like, hey, time to put some gas in the car. Well, that's why I use Inside Tracker. I want a dashboard to my inner health. I want to know what's going on inside me so that if there's something that comes up, I can take care of it. Their food first, supplement second suggestions have really helped me dial in my health. Go to insidetracker.com slash ageist. Save 20% on all their products. Hey, Dr. Vonda. How are you, David? Um, I'm, I'm doing great. I slept nine hours and 45 minutes last night. Oh, I feel, I feel like a superhuman. So <laughs> oh, that is the best. Yes. How are you? I've been so well since uh, we last spoke and I, you know, I can't complain. Life is good. And, um, so you do a few things. What, uh, um, you're known for, you know, sort of muscular skeletal aging yeah. and, and, Bones. Bad things happen to people's bones. Well, you know, I'm a orthopedic sports surgeon. So my uh, residency was in orthopedics and my, my fellowship uh, in New York was in sports medicine and shoulder surgery. And so I carry that bag of tools with me that I work with uh, professional athletes all the way to recreational athletes, people who want to be both of those things and are on the journey. Um, and I do surgery every week. So people always want to know, are you still doing surgery? Because I have a lot of interests, but you know, like so many of us, we just find time for what's important. So, you know, something that's really exciting that I'm doing uh, for surgery right now is because um, we hadn't talked about doing this, but I do in old athletes, right? There's a whole generation of athletes who have done their careers or done their, their recreational careers. And you know what, their knees have developed arthritis. So I am so pleased to be the orthopod who treats, who puts outpatient total knees in athletes and active people. Cause you know how we do it, David, we no. do it outpatient two hours later, they're getting up, they're walking well, out the door. Uh, well, wait, 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 I know. Wait, wait. And I say to people, do not come to me unless you want to be coached like an athlete. Cause I'm going to have you walking and we're going to recover. And my, the, I just moved to Florida less than a year ago or about a year ago. And the first gentleman I put total knees in, he's skiing in Vail this week. So uh, about seven months out. So I, anyway, that's remarkable. Well, right? I, 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 <laughs> stop. Okay. I need to like uh, understand this. You're talking total knee joint replacement. Yes. Uh, healing with steel, as we like to say in the industry. Yes. And, and how? <laughs> What's the, and you said it's outpatient? Yeah, you know, they come in in the morning. Well, number one, it all has to do with patient selection, right? I People have the expectation that when they come to me, that they want to be actively involved in their care and push themselves, right? I am right. not the correct doctor for someone who just really does not want to have that mindset. So that's number one. Number two, it is, they come in in the morning to the hospital. They, I do their surgery. I take, because I do my own surgery. I don't have PAs or anybody. It takes me about an hour and 15 minutes. They go to the recovery room and within two to three hours, they walk out the door. Now here's why, here's why. Um, 
when I trained, people stayed in the hospital for a week. They were miserable. It was very hard. And I'm not saying it's a cakewalk, but we use multimodality pain regimen. So it's not, it's only one of the five things we use as narcotics. We use a, a nerve block. I inject the whole joint with long acting numbing medicine on my way as I'm sewing you up. We use anti-inflammatories. We use things like Tylenol, which is a pain med, but not a narcotic. And then we use a, a drug called gabapentin, which is for the nerve component. We use Lyrica, which is for the brain component. And finally, if we need narcotics, we have the availability. But I'm going to tell you, David, not only do they walk out, they use very few narcotics. And thank God, because we've got a disaster in this country going on, right? So um, that's one amazing thing that's happening in orthopedic sports surgery right now. The other thing is for more typical procedures like meniscus surgery or cartilage procedures. Um, I am now doing standard arthroscopy, which lots of your listeners will have heard small incisions of uh, doing knee, shoulder, hip surgery with that even smaller with needles. Now we call it nano needle technology. And there is virtually David, no recovery. I do it. I do it under local anesthesia in awake people. So if you would come to me and say, Hey Vaughn, I've got this popping clicking in the back of my knee and I can't squat down anymore. And we do an MRI and you've got a meniscus tear. I would offer you an awake under local needle arthroscopy to take out the broken piece and you're listening to your playlist. I invite people to bring a playlist that, that relaxes them. And there is, there are no incisions, no general anesthesia, no need for physical therapy. It's just amazing what the technology has come to on the orthopedic side of my life. Now you, you started this conversation asking about aging and I think all these things go along with it, but my life's work has been really dispelling the myth that aging is an inevitable decline from the vitality of youth down some slippery slope to frailty and dispelling the myth that there's nothing we can do about it. You know, we know now I've started using the word since I last spoke with you, differentiating life expectancy and health span, right? Oh, I want to tell you my life goal. I'm my goal is I want to, I want health span and lifespan to be the same. Yes. Equal That's what life. I want. The health span and the life, <laughs> or as my husband will say, he wants to, he wants to, uh, go, 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 live amazing, live amazing, and just drop off, right? Right, right. I like. I'm with him. I like Queen Elizabeth's example. She saw the prime minister on Tuesday, and just went to bed on Wednesday night. I mean, that's how I want to go, right? Right. Amazing, amazing. So, but that that does not happen for most of us without some conscientious effort. So I, I started out my career in orthopedics to prove that it mattered and that we could significantly change the trajectory of our musculoskeletal health and our lives by the toolbox that I have as an orthopedic surgeon, which is mobility. I tell my residents and fellows, you know, by my my why, why do I get up and wake, make the donuts every morning? I don't actually make donuts, but you know what I mean? Why do I get up and go to work? It's because I know that by saving mobility, whether I save your knee, whether I make your shoulder not hurt, whether any of the things we do, why saving your mobility, I'm actually saving you from the ravages of chronic disease because there is no disease that mobility, including our brains, will not positively affect. And it puts me and, and those that do what I do in a really hopeful, powerful place to give people exactly what you've said to equalize the health span and the lifespan. Because right now on average in this country, the health span is 62. Not in your crowd, but in this country, right? That's when chronic disease rears its it's a uh, ugly head, if you want to say. So what do we do to even those things out? And, and my research showed both in terms of bone health, muscle health, brain health, um, that you can really affect all those things with mobility. So I get really excited about this. You can tell David, I just go on and on. Well, and on. you know, I, I'm, I'm Mr. Sporty Spice over here. So, um, <laughs> 
you know, as I as I was saying to you earlier, um, I've been in Park City this winter and I'm doing the master's ski racing program. Yes. So there's a couple of people in their mid-20s who are like astonishing athletes. And then there's a couple of people in their 30s, mm-hmm. one or two in their 50s. Mm-hmm. What was shocking to me, most of the people are in their 60s and 70s. I love that. And it's about that. and about a third of them are women. Mm-hmm. And, um, th- th- like, I mean, they move at very high speeds. That's what I can say. And I they're like a vision of like, there's not, there's no cognitive decline here. There's no, like, none of that. No. There is no age unless they no. told you how old they were. You would be like, you have oh, no idea. Skiing at 70 miles down the mountain, 70 miles an hour. I have no idea how old she is. Right. And you know, a word I use a lot and, you know, socially on social media and in my writing is being truly ageless. Like don't let ageless, authentic, meaning do, do what I want to do. I am who I am. I'm you're the, you're skiing down a mountain, right. And indefinable. I want people to have to guess, not say, oh, she's obviously X, right. right? But tell me, so you're skiing down the mountain. Is it, Yeah. is it, uh, I don't know. I'm not a very good skier. So I'm trying to envision like just tucking and going down this uh, crazy slope. It's not just a uh, full speed that, um, that leads in fatality. Uh, <laughs> so no, can't do that. So there's, um, you know, slalom, which is the gates are fairly tight. There's mm-hmm. giant slalom that was further apart yes. and super G where they're even further apart and you're going faster. Mm-hmm. Um, but these things are happening like they, you know, they start us out on, you know, like green slopes and you're um, doing, um, you know, sort of basic skills training and then it gets a little steeper. But now we're on the men's um, World Cup Hill, um, wow. which is um, there are consequences if you fall. Uh, it, it's, um, you know, talk about focusing your attention and focusing your brain. That'll right. do it. Uh, so it's um, uh, it's all these uh, that it's very challenging to my brain and my body, um, principally my brain, because there are all these movement patterns that are just like, I was a reasonable skier before, but this is just like, it's like a different sport. Um, and it you know, sounds the- like not only physical brain, but mindset, like you have to get over some modicum of fear. You're like, <laughs> yeah, well, this, the stuff at the beginning, when you, the stuff that you think is steep is like, now is oh. just like nothing. It's like, <laughs> It's just, you don't even think about it because yeah. the things that are um, really actually steep, steep are <laughs> really steep. Yeah. <laughs> well, I admire you. That's amazing. You're doing that, at, you know, and again, at any age, you know. Well, we can learn new things. I mean, that's sort of what I wanted to do is just say like, hey, OK, I'm not learning this at age three. There's no hope of me ever being on the World Cup. Um <laughs> There's really, <laughs> this is just like, like, I'm never going to go to the moon. It's fine. Uh, okay. um, but I can learn every time, every time I go, coaches mm-hmm. teach me new things. And I try to, you know, they, they, and I incorporate like 3% of it each time. And I have to relearn it and relearn it and relearn it. But um, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's amazing. My brain feels sharp. Brain. Yeah. It's amazing yeah. for your brain. But let us I want to talk to you about um, some other things. Um, you know, you, you'd mentioned your, when people come to see you, you're also interested in hormones and glucose and a lot of other things because they really impact the healing process and possibly how they got hurt in the first place. Right. You know, so uh, I'll tell you two sides of this story. So when men come to me and have multiple aching tendons or actually multiple tendon tears and Uh, And they report to me, they do not take anabolic steroids. There's a certain amount of people who are in a, who want to do that, but most of my patients do not, but they still have these repeated tears. And like, how is this happening? I measure their testosterone because there is good literature in the orthopedic uh, world and in the endocrinology world that sometimes when, when, and because men don't always realize in general that in the same way that women's hormones fluctuate in a very public way, men's hormones fluctuate, right? And testosterone can fluctuate or even be frankly low um, without any other signs that anything is wrong in your body, right? So when I have 
a man come in with multiple tendon problems, I measure their free and total testosterone. And if it's low, I send them to either their primary care doctor or their uh, urologist to supplement it up because we know we can bring men's testosterone to a baseline level. It is false that you can hyper elevate it. It's not the point to make it. You can actually can't do that. But when you supplement with testosterone, you can bring it to a functional level, which is what we want. In fact, you know what, since I've been doing this and since I've been running my I mentioned to you earlier, I run precision longevity retreats for people here in Lake Nona, but I think I need to start measuring baseline hormones and NAD plus energy levels about 35 to 40. Because when I have people coming in 50, 60, I don't know what I'm comparing to because if their testosterone's 200, I don't know if they used to be 600 and that's a big Delta or maybe they were just 350 their whole lives. And this is, I don't know, but Mm -hmm. because otherwise we're supplementing blind. So that's the testosterone side, the estrogen. And of course, women have lots of testosterone too. I mean, more than estrogen actually, but when women come into my clinic, especially in midlife, 40 to 70 ish or so. And they say, oh, out of nowhere, my shoulder's hurting. Or, oh my God, my whole body is aching. You know, sometimes it's easy. Uh, It would be easy for a surgeon to say, oh, you've got a frozen shoulder, get an injection, go to therapy. Um, But I think that uh, people need to be listened to more. And so I go down the road of um, how old they are. Well, I know how old they are from the chart or we start talking about their hormones and lo and behold, they eventually say something like, but, oh my God, Dr. Wright, I am falling apart. I do not know what happens. I'm falling apart. Both men and women say this to me. And then sometimes they say, and my brain is just so foggy. And when I hear that can cl- those things grouped together with a musculoskeletal complaint, we start talking about perimenopause and menopause and fluctuations of estrogen in their system and the profound changes that go on when hormones begin to fluctuate, right? Because in the, in the popular press right now, we're talking, thank God, a lot about uh, midlife and menopause and perimenopause. But what people don't realize, because we're talking mostly about hot flashes and brain fog and sleep disturbances, is that the musculoskeletal effects of losing your estrogen are profound and permanent, right? So, uh, you know, right now, I just had a DEXA scan yesterday and thank God my bones are hanging in there. But, you know, the insurance will not pay for a DEXA scan until you're 65. Well, women can lose 20% of their total bone density between the onset of perimenopause, which is about 45 and five years after menopause, right? So menopause is the day, 366th day after your last period. So within a 10 year period, you can lose 20% of your bone density. It's nearly impossible to get back, right? So the other, so that's permanent. Loss of lean muscle mass is difficult to get. The problem with not having enough lean muscle mass or bone density And what people don't realize is that 80% of all women in midlife, as their hormones fluctuate, have musculoskeletal pain and 25% have such severe pain, it's disabling. So, I mean, my main symptom of perimenopause when I was 48 was my whole body hurt. And until I started on HRT, I didn't recognize that, but I kind of am on the tirade that you hear me on is because the musculoskeletal effects of fluctuating hormones can be profound. And and I'll remind you, I think I probably said this to you last time when we talk about bones is that when people fall down, usually in their seventies, both men and women fall down and break their hip. 50% of men and women do not return to Mm pre-fall function. And 30% Mm -hmm. of men die. So Mm -hmm. it's really critical as I take calls so many nights in our hospital and people are falling from a standing position that we get ahead of this process, right? We got to know and got to work on our bones. So these women in my community look at me like, you want me to do what? I want them to lift really heavy. None of this pamby stuff with pink weights. And 
I want them to jump up and down 20 times a day mm -hmm. to keep the, the bones regenerating. Right. And they're like, you want me to do what you're jumping up and yes, I do. It only takes 20 jumps a day. It's not that much to ask. So I just think it's really interesting and I, and not enough worth pods are talking about it. I tend to talk about it all the time. And that's yeah. the up my practice from the true surgery side to the taking care of people who want to be amazing all the time. That uh, I've told people that statistic about the broken hip recovery rate yeah. and I get hate mail. They're like, you know, you're, you're trying you're to like, you're fear mongering, you're trying to scare people. And it's like, well, yeah, you should be scared. <laughs> well, David, but you know what? You are thoroughly backed up by research. You know, you, I know your work. You are not a fear monger. And that is solidly backed up by research. People, you know. I also think this, this, um, you know, I get a DEXA scan once a year. There's 75 bucks. Um, That's and, good. And you know the 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 bonus. Um, I have not. I have no affiliation with the Dexa company or any of that. <laughs> but like, if you get it, the thing is, if you go into the hospital and they they do a bone density scan on you, all the only data you're going to get on that is your bone density, and yeah. they're just measuring sort of a certain part of your body. If you do a Dexa bonus, you're going to get um, muscle composite. You're going to get a whole body comp. Yes. Um, and then if you do it year to year you see the change. So you see like gaining bone, losing bone, gaining muscle, losing muscle. And you can, it, you know, I'm really big on this idea of tracking that yeah. versus the idea of just like, well, I feel okay. Well, you, you lost 20% of your bone. You, you feel okay until you break it. Well, that's <laughs> like, the thing, right? It's silent until it's not. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I just, I mean, one of the people in my ski racing program, she's a woman, she's in her early seventies and she, we, were, you know, I heard her having discussion with the coach that she's been diagnosed with, um, you know, pretty severe osteoporosis and she's got to be, get on like serious drugs and like, she's worried about skiing and I, and I, wow. and <laughs> she, I was going to talk about risk. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 and I said like, well, you know, she was, she was like, I don't want to talk about it. I said, well, okay. You know, but, um. There's, oh, I, I want to give another, just sort of in the realm of like lifting heavy weight, because I'm a huge fan of that. Yeah. There's this other like thing that I saw about a year. It was amazing. It's called Osteo Strong. Do you know this thing? Oh, so, wait. Somebody told me about this. It, 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 I thought it was just BS until I, they brought me in and they like made me do the thing. It's so it's a, ser right? it's a series of machines in like a studio. Mm -hmm. And what you're doing is you you're pushing on something with, you know, either your arms, your legs, your hips, but it's not moving. Right. And what you're doing is just sort of max effort on the thing yes. for, it's like 10 seconds or 15 seconds or something, but that's enough to like really safely because you're not throwing any weight around or anything um, to stimulate the bone. I thought, I don't know if anybody has that issue. It's kind of, I, th I thought it was sort of an interesting solution. You know what? Another orthopod uh, did tell me about that. And when I first heard about it, I'm like, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. but then <laughs> I started looking and, you know, even for building lean muscle mass, now this is not what I'm doing. I am actually lifting heavy stuff three to five times, but uh, there is some research that mm. in the same way, even uh, isokinetic, you know, you're not moving anything, mm -hmm. but you're just pushing hard. Mm -hmm. And I, I got to read this in deeper, but even visualization in, or in your oh. mind of imagining lifting the heaviest thing you can possibly lift when they subsequently test people mm -hmm. have gained uh, muscle strength, which that's amazing. But I got to read that more. So we'll, we'll put that in the must investigate more category. <laughs> It's yeah. it's not nearly as much fun as deadlifting. I gotta say, <laughs> I feel so like a badass. Oh, sorry, FCC. Uh, when I lift heavy, it's crazy, it, right? It just feels yeah. awesome. Yeah. Um, how are you talking about um, glucose levels with people? Well, your audience can't see it, but look at this. I oh, you got a CGM? Yes, yeah. I've been wearing this for three months because. I wanted, I'm a data junkie like you, right? I wanted to understand because what I found is uh, I was getting tired every afternoon about three o'clock 
And I had start reading the literature about really trying to get my brain around the effect of glucose spikes and what they do in the short term and long term. So, you know, when, for those of you that are listening, when you eat a simple carb or put white sugar in your coffee or whatever carb load you want to put on, uh, if you do that on an empty system, that is rapidly absorbed into your blood and it overwhelms your metabolism. You know, it, it is rapidly by the, by the, you know, the dumping of insulin into your blood pushed into your muscles until your poor little mitochondria, which work at a steady pace. Your mitochondria are the powerhouses in your body, which make from fuel that you feed it ATP, which is the primary energy source in our body, right? So, but mitochondria work at a set pace. So if you've got, I'm making these numbers up. If you've got a glucose spike of 500, there's nowhere for that sugar to go. So it piles on, David, I have found fat at, in your fat. I have found fat in shoulder joints. I have found fat, more fat than normal in knee joints. Our body just sticks it. It's like putting it in a, a full closet because you got to put it somewhere. But those spikes are really dangerous. So, I mean, in the short term, it's what makes us constantly hungry and craving more food. It makes us chronically fatigued. It's part of what wakes us up in the middle of the night because at 3 a.m., if you are really uh, glucose bound or mostly glucose, uh, you're going to wake up because at 3 a.m., you're going to drop your blood sugar. And for safety, your body will wake you up, right? Right. You're more susceptible when you're metabolically deranged or dysfunctioning, you're more susceptible to injury and, and immune dysfunction. So it goes on and on. So David, I had to know, and you can't know unless you measure it. So I went on, you know, thank God I have a prescription pad. I went online and I got myself a glucose monitor and I set about uh, trying to not have glucose spikes. And so I pulled up these articles that are all over the internet now about how the sequence of how you, one was, uh, the primary one was written 2015, another one was in 2020, which showed that if you, I call it ordering my food, uh, eat your food in a certain order, right. you will not spike. And that order is veggie and fibers, followed by protein and fat, followed by, if you must, uh, complex carbs. And I'm, and I'm not a keto person, so I do eat complex carbs, but in that order. And do you know what I found David by experimenting? So the first time I put it on, remember, I think I'm healthy. I'm very conscious. I'm doing all the things. The first time I took a fasting glucose, it was in the nineties, which I'm like, what is my glucose doing near a hundred? Because that is the line between healthy and pre-diabetic. I'm like, what am I doing so close? Well, you know, the truth is that cortisol can have an effect on blood sugar, uh, being perimenopausal, which I am, I'm postmenopausal now, um, can affect that. Right. I was not happy. So I began experimenting and now I can tell you that when I order my food in that order, I do not spike. I know that if I'm in the operating room and it's a highly stressful, just normal workplace environment, that I'm much more likely to spike. I know now that it is true when I am mobile after a meal, you know, everyone will tell you, go walk around after your meal. You'll push all the glucose into your muscle. It's true for me because mm -hmm. I know my own data now. But after I, I just eliminated the spikes from my life, I did not like where my uh, baseline was. It was still in the 90s. And I'm like, there is no way in God's green earth I am going to live with my blood sugar in the 90s, right? So I started doing more experimenting with my, when I lift heavy, how many days does the burn from a big lift get me? My heavy lifting days, and which I do all the all those things, right? I've learned to back squat and I've learned to deadlift. And this morning I was... I was chuckling because I looked at the young guys and they were doing the same weights as I was in my barbell, uh, uh, my lifting bench press, my barbell bench press. They were doing like 40 reps. I don't even know why, but we were doing the same weights and I was doing my three to five uh, times four, but I get two days out of a heavy lift burn. 
meaning that I have successfully lowered my baseline glucose flattening to between 70 and 80. And I now know that when I'm hungry, my glucose is about 70, 71. So isn't this amazing data? I mean, you can totally manipulate if you need to or alter, right? If you know your yeah, data. I, yeah, yeah. I, I, um, I, I wore a continuous glucose monitor for a month um, to just sort of experiment like, like yeah, you what did and you find? um i found some really interesting things that um stress of any kind spikes my glucose yes. so that's any kind so that means if i'm in the sauna my my glucose level goes up to like 120 oh, um wow. just sitting because i'm i'm my body takes that as a hormetic stress yes. if i'm um having some kind of like other uh externally stressful event also glucose goes up um, I mean, it comes right back down once I get out. Right, right, right. But, but that, what, what I, one of the key takeaways I got from this was that's the problem with chronic stress. Yes. It, then you have chronically, you know, heightened glucose levels and you're going to get inflammation. Oh, that's the bad key. for your brain and all kinds of stuff, right? Every disease of aging. Yeah. Of aging is due to the inflammation and exactly high glucose levels we're talking about. So that's the fast, that's one of the fascinating things I've been doing to try to really understand my own metabolism. And, and, you know, even this lifting heavy business is, you know, it's more than fun to me. One of the other aging gurus in the country says this a lot, you have to retro plan how you want to be right. So if I mm -hmm. see, if I see my, my parents are 83 and they're really, really healthy until they're not. And when they're something happens, it's, it's not like a, it's like, they're really sick. So if I want to pre-plan at their age to not even know that I've lived another 30 years, right. I got a plan for that now. And so that that's one of the reasons I'm lifting heavy. I want to keep my lean muscle mass. Uh, Cause I'm physiologically a muscly person because, and the reason I switched to lifting heavy weights for those that don't do it is that there is clear data that lifting heavy is what will maintain your power. And as we age, that's what we need. Most mm -hmm. of us, unless we're still racing and I'm not racing, I used to do marathons. I'm not racing. Um, I don't need to endure. I don't need my muscles to endure. I need to be able to get off up off the floor with no hands. I need to be able to run up a flight of stairs. I need not to fall down from a standing position. And plus, frankly, if I'm vain, I like the way muscles look, right? And so why not get that on the side? But the amazing thing about lifting heavy is it increases mitochondrial number and it um, causes your satellite cells, which are your muscle stem cells to multiply. And we want healthy stem cells. This is some of the early work that we did when I was still in a lab in the early 2000s. We just ran really old animals on treadmills and found that their stem cells went from really old, spindly, programmed cell death on the way, no growth factors being produced, two weeks on a treadmill twice a day, and their stem cells were totally rejuvenated. They were plump and fat. They were producing growth factor. They were dividing again. And subsequently other research have, have found that that is the same in humans. So I use that information now for these knee replacements that I was talking to you before. I prehab everybody so that their muscles are primed with healthy stem cells before we go to surgery. Mm. I think that the, um, I, I mean, I think we sort of need both kinds of fitness, right? So we need that sort of um, metabolically uh, sort of zone two, that stuff. So that's super important. But the other, you know, the thing that we, there are a couple of things, at least, but I've seen that we lose as we age. One of them is, you know, mitochondrial efficiency. So we want to work on that. But the muscle thing is that it's the fast twitch muscles that seem to go quickest. That's so right. Fast twitch muscles are what produce power and speed. And if you only want to think about this in terms of um, if you're if you're going to fall, guess which muscle set you need to prevent that or to cushion that. It's not your endurance muscles. It's you need to be able to like snap your body around quickly 
to catch yourself. And that's a fast twitch muscle, which you, you know, from what I've seen, the only way you gain that is by lifting up heavy stuff. Um, you know, the yogis, the yogis hate me when I say this, I'm, I mean, <laughs> uh, but that's, <laughs> yeah, that's sort of the deal. Lifting heavy stuff or, um, going fast. So yeah. the, the other side of lifting heavy is I have shifted. I, you know what? I love high intensity interval training. I love mm -hmm. pounding my heart rate up to 186, but, mm -hmm. and I had my lactate threshold measured. I have the luxury of being able to do that here in the place I work and found that I was very, very fit in the high register of my heart rate. Cause even at my age, I could still get it up to 186 and sustainably keep it. But my lactate threshold, that place when I switched from uh, being most efficient and improving my mitochondrial function to anaerobic metabolism, where there was a byproduct of lactate acid and it, sh it decreases my efficiency, was at a very low heart rate. It was It's at 125 for me, which mm -hmm. means that I have a very good... Uh, uh, anaerobic engine, but a very bad efficiency engine. So my zone two. So what I've switched to is doing what the pros do pros base train, which is zone two at very yeah. low heart rates yeah. for that. But then I sprint twice a week, like mm -hmm. guns to the wall as mm -hmm. I warm up with my zone two. And then I just go again because that mm -hmm. too will help with the power, right? Yeah, and the zone two. So I did this thing last um, year. Uh, Joel Jameson, who I had on the program, who's like a, you know, the conditioning guru, and it's all about that zone two. Getting enough of that work in will um, actually helps all the rest of it because, That's right. like, Correct. like you can only maintain like an ana a full anaerobic. You can only do that for like eight seconds, right. and then guess what? You you need the aerobic. <laughs> so the aerobic underpins all sort of movement. Yes, that's right. Um, yeah. And it's, it's kind of boring and irritating, but whatever, it's just like, you just got to do it. Works. it. But yeah. you know, the other thing that I see a lot in my clinic as an orthopedic surgeon, especially because I have the privilege of my office is right in the middle of this Taj Mahal performance center is that there are six days a week on the indoor football field, which my, the windows of my office look over, there are these high intensity interval classes and People love them. And I get it. That teacher is fascinating. She is so great, but they are all showing up in my office with yep. overuse injuries. That's right. And, and people don't realize that intense like that every single day is a stress mm -hmm. on your body and it breaks you down. So mm -hmm. I, I always think we need to be a little smarter as we accumulate birthday candles, but. Absolutely. I, I mean, I, I'll do a max heart rate maybe once a week yeah. um I'll, I'll do something sort of you know for me like my max is more like 168 or so mm -hmm. uh and i can only maintain that for a very short amount of time yeah. um and then sort of the zone below it is is like you know for me sort of like 135 to 150 so I'll maybe do that like you know usually twice a week yeah. um but it's thinking about the how impactful these things on our bodies and the cortisol levels and the like you get into this overuse thing you know we mentioned deadlifts a, a heavy deadlift is an incredibly impactful thing on your body your yeah. your central nervous system your skeleton like the hormones everything is like yeah. full on so I, you know i'll do that I, I only do like a deadlift once a week and maybe once every two weeks because it's just too, it's much, too much on my body yeah yeah, yeah. and but but i want people who don't know this research to know that what you just said is very research-based. You do not have to do that for, to have the effect mm -hmm. once or twice a week is, is your body will respond and remember, right? I think if I was 19, it would be different, but I'm not. Well, so. We could get away with anything, you know, <laughs> with the other things going on when we were 19, but yeah. What, what else are you doing for your, um, your mitochondria and your metabolic health? So lifting heavy things, I flatten my glucose curve and I am zone two training and the, and, and sprinting and the way we talked about, and, um, I haven't told, I haven't told a lot of people this, but now I'm telling your whole crowd. Okay. Uh, I know. Cause I was just thinking about this morning. I have six, 
six months, I'm going to, I want to get back into the, I was in the best shape of my life when I was 40. It was before I had my, uh, my daughter and, uh, I was, uh, working out like I was twice, twice a day. I was going to do triathlons, biking, running, lifting. And, you know, I was setting PRs. Um, and I want to get back to the best shape of my life, but not that shape, right? Not that endurance shape. I want to uh, build a lot of lean muscle in the next six months. I want to, you know, I had my body composition. I have from that time to this time, I have about 10% more body fat than I had then, which I'm not that happy about, but menopause happens. So I'm really, you know, the last three months of describing to you, I was healthy-ish, and now I'm really getting my ducks in order to take it now from optimizing health to entering peak performance, because I don't think that this birthday I have coming up has anything to do with my ability to, to get back to peak performance and therefore affect my longevity. So, you know, what does that mean for me? That means, um, these, these things that I'm already doing, I'm going to be really serious about my macros. I mean, I, I count my macros. It's a lot of work people to know <laughs> measure. This is six, six ounces of fish and it has seven grams per ounce. It's a lot, but you know, it, why not now? So I'm going to do that. And I, and with the goal of, of losing a 10% body fat, building lean muscle mass, and you have to do one thing at a time, right? You either have to be in yeah. deficit or building, but you know, you cycle that. So that's interesting, right? I think that, um, you know, you, you use the term healthy-ish and um, one of my ongoing pet peeves with the medical community is that they've lowered the bar so much that like sort of, okay, it, you know, a, a doctor will tell you you're, oh, you seem to be doing okay, which means he doesn't feel you're in a current disease state, um, which is sort of the rung below healthy-ish. Right. There's no active disease. Right. There's no active disease. So you're okay. Or your disease is managed. You know, philosophically, (laughs) you have type 2 diabetes. Your A1C is 7. So you're not brittle at 14, but you're also not 5.2. Is that healthy ish? Some would say that's not healthy at all. Right. So, yeah. (laughs) So then we, you know, I, 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 and I understand why um, this goes on, but, yeah. but it's uh, to me, I, I mean, I often talk about this. I, I had a doctor once tell me, they looked at me and they said, oh, you're active. And w- <laughs> what they meant was like, I was like, and I was, I just like went ballistic on them. And I was just like, what do you, what? Like, <laughs> like, and here's this, like, you know, this dude with this, this doctor, with this belly. And I was like, I know. Let me show you active what that really looks like. Cause yeah. you have, you, you've no idea. <laughs> like, can't you raise the bar for your patients? I, I, I don't know what they're scared of. Like just to, to tell people the truth of what well, you and really you know need what, to David, do. I, I am that kind of doctor. I tell people the truth, but I can tell you, even when you get the angry hate mail about the bones, <laughs> right? I have had, you know, my patients love me. If you look on my reviews, they like being listened to. But there are angry people for whom I have said to them simple things like our bo- our joints bear 10 times body weight. And if we want our joints not to hurt, well, we just need to unload them. I haven't even said the word fat. I just, <laughs> we need to unload them because we need to build lean muscle mass. We need to unload the fat, right? But people are so caustic about that word because when I do not judge, I'm not judging you when I say right. things like, we need to unload your joints. I am making an observation in the same way I would have observed ten dollars in my checking account yeah. versus one hundred dollars. It's an observation, not a judgment. But, but the other thing I want to discuss with you because your your entire platform is about elevating the discussion uh, about aging, and and I feel like people need to understand the grandparent effect. Have you ever talked about that on your? There is also solid research that grandparents can have profound effects on the health of their grandchildren. Mm. In the same way, parents sometimes are like, I don't understand. My kid is eating juice all the time and hot dogs. And and I say to them, well, they do what they see. 
And you have a profound ability to who buys that food for them, right? Because if you want a healthy kid, you are the most powerful driver. Research shows that grandparents can be equally as powerful in the health of two generations below Mm. them. So it works both ways. Mm. Healthy grandparents can have a profound effect, but if we have generational of not generations of knowledge gap, or uh, I mean, it's just going to perpetuate. So I don't know if you've ever talked about the power of of people who have two generations that they've nurtured to change the health of their entire ecosystem. Well, I, I think it goes to the delusion of invisibility. So. People, you know, they're like, well, I'm invisible. Nobody really pays attention to me. They're not watching you. That's BS. Everybody is watching everybody all the time. And Mm -hmm. people are seeing what you're doing. And if you model healthy, good behavior, it's being absorbed. People see that. People, you know, people will see like, oh, wow, you're you're like very mobile. You're doing all this stuff. How are you doing that? Um, and And I think that that's, one of the things, one of the reasons to stay healthy mm-hmm. is that it's not just about you. It's yeah. about all the people that see you and yeah. you're modeling that for them. And you can model the converse too. If you're, you know, engaging in self-destructive, unhealthy behavior and it's manifesting in your, you know, clearly in the in the health situation of your body, that's being, you know, people like, oh, well, uh, I guess that's normal. Well, n- no, it's not. Yeah. Well, and you know what that brings to mind? I may have mentioned this last time, but my 83-year-old father, who is also very well living with us, you know, my whole life, David, he was a marathoner. We would not, we lived on a farm. We would not know where he was for hours. Like, which running route did he go on today? Well, he's now 83 and he has a total hip. He still walks six to 10 miles a day. He is still gone for hours, right? He has to, we live in Florida now. He has to wear a camel on his back. So he doesn't. I love this. I know. And so people know him in this town such that when I'm doing community talks here, I'm like, and my father does this and please don't run him over because sometimes he won't stay (laughs) on the sidewalk. But I have grown up with this. It is an expectation for me that even if I need a total joint, I'm going to be out there because I've just seen the profound effect on his health. Do you know what he does? Cause he's bored now he's retired. He is, he used to be a, a he w- had a master's degree in theology. Oh no. He has pulled out the Greek original Greek texts of the books he used to read. And he's plowing through them again. I'm like, dad, you haven't studied Greek since you were in graduate school. And he's like, yeah, I know, but it's good for my brain. So <laughs> you're, is. You're, he's modeling that for me. I'm like, oh my God, right. I'm just reading some articles off the internet, you know, my, yeah. my academic articles. I'm not even reading another a language, but, but, you know, when grandparents say things like, having grandchildren is the best thing. It's so much different than having your own children. And I have my first grandchild now because we can give them back. Well, I propose to people who have are, are participating in their grandchildren's life that what it means to have them enjoy your company doesn't have to mean feeding them hot dogs and ice cream and uh, all the permissiveness. You can really instill them with a lifetime of health, which you would want, right? By modeling for them at grandma's, my my poor grandson at grandma's, he's going to eat asparagus off my plate, just like my daughter did. Right? It's going <laughs> to happen. So anyway, let's go back to this idea of um, you know, sort of going from base level non or not obvious or managed disease state to then sort of healthy-ish, yes. and then you mentioned peak performance. Yeah. So. Why would a regular person want to be in peak performance? Well, you know, peak performance um, means different things to different people, right? If you start out at, at a, as a former pro athlete or a very high level and you just want to squeeze the last few drops out of your performance, that is a very different build than, let's say, someone who was on the verge of that line we talked about, right? They're mm-hmm. healthy-ish. Now they're maybe they're, I mean, all the people who do my workshops and stuff, we, we 
order our food. We do lactate threshold testing. We help them understand their data. Some of them, I put them on glucose monitors so that we bring them up to a level where they're not spiking all the time. They know how to lift heavy weights and they are zone two training as a baseline. Bringing them up to peak performance is not only physical, but it's mental, right? Because part of being able to have agency, which the agency is the ability to choose in the moment and affect your destiny, right? We are not victims of our surroundings generally, right? Most of us, I mean, some people don't have a lot of choices. I want to recognize that. But most of us are not victims of, oh, it just runs in my family. No, we have agency through what we eat, how we move, who we talk to, who we spend time with, um, how much alcohol we do or do not drink to profoundly affect our future. So peak performance takes us from a state of, okay, I am healthy. My labs are all okay. I have enough energy. And we haven't, I even measure their NAD plus because NAD plus is a coenzyme of more than 400 uh, cellular reactions. And so we have to have enough energy in our bodies. But once they're in that state, that's not the end of it, right? We then remeasure every four months because if you have zone two trained for four months, your heart rate levels will change. You need to be re, uh, remeasured and then you'll work out a diff- at a, out at a different way. Um, so we keep we get to a state of health, then we progress to um can we not just learn how to heavy lift? Can we do it three to four times a week doing different body parts? Can we drop our, our body composition to be uh, fat within a more normal range? Not, you know, I need to lose 10% body fat. I'm still not in, I'm not in the obese stage, but I don't want to be close. You know, can we get people into a more normal range? So peak performance means something different to everybody, but it's also a mindset, David, just like we were talking about uh, when we deadlift, we feel like superstars, right? So I find that being in a state of peak performance is having the faith to believe that we can do something that we cannot see. It's ooh, almost- Ooh, tell yes. me. Oh, I love that. Yes. You so I have the opportunity in my career. See. Yeah. Oh, Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So I have the opportunity in my career as an orthopedic sports doctor and uh, to work with a lot of high performance people in my lifetime. Uh, I married a pro athlete. He's, you know, he's no longer playing, but he's a, he has a high performance mindset and it's interesting how he views where working out. And then I, myself, some would say as a surgeon are in this, this, when I'm in the OR in this fear, so this sphere So when I think about what it takes to be in peak performance, it's mental, it's physical, it's, it's, it's physical brain, it's physical body, but it's mostly mental. And what I just said to you was to be in a state of peak performance means that every moment that we're doing something, 1,440 minutes a day, we have the opportunity to choose whether we just do it ho-hum, or whether we try to be excellent in every moment. Now, let's recognize that it's not easy and that on most days, there is a gap between peak performance and everyday performance. But do you know what makes peak performers peak performers? It's because every day they are trying to be excellent so that the energy it takes to perform optimally decreases. You, you, if you need to rise to an occasion, if you're not always working towards being excellent, whether it's physical exercise, brain, mental attitude, it takes a lot of energy. You got to psych yourself up, right? But if every day we strive, the dog, my husband, who's a hockey player, describes it as the dog days, right? There are 82 games in a season before the, the, um, all-star break. There's 55 games. It's like slogging it out, but you must present every day working as hard as you can because that's what peak performers do. That's what, you know, when I interview, uh, I've, I've gotten to interview Hugh Herr from MIT who lost his legs in a, 
in a climbing accident and then rebuilt new ones. And he's climbing again. He would be a fascinating guest for this. But, you know, he is big on agency. He's when he he tells the story when he woke up having had his accident and have had in surgery and he had two above the knee amputations because he is a peak performer. His response to that was not, oh, my God, my life is over. I'll never be the same. He's like, oh, OK. I have to rethink my body parts and what I do to get them back. And he built some and he now climbs again and those legs adjust in height. And so from talking to people like him and knowing in myself that whether, I mean, this example I gave you, I have brought myself up to, I I just redid all my labs. I'm in a good place right now because I've really focused on optimizing all health. And now I'm going to move to peak performance. I believe that I can be in the place that I once was I am believing that I can go to a place that I cannot see right now, right? You have to believe that as a peak performer. It's almost it's almost faith, right? Faith in what you cannot see to push yourself physically, mentally, mindset to be in a different place. Does that make sense? I'm not trying to get all metaphysical, but that's no. What it, it's do. um, I mean, since we're both kind of sporty, it uh, I've I've had a lot of coaches, teachers, people who push me. And I'm, I mean, I, I, now I, I do this like ski racing thing and, yeah. you know, I'll look down at something and I'll say, I can't, I, I don't even know how to like do this. Mm-hmm. And the coach will say, just do it. And, you, you know, it's like, R- really? But uh, <laughs> it's, it's, and you know, I don't do it well, but um, the second time I do it better than the first time. Um well, and I couldn't I don't imagine know. doing it is, but he could. Right. He could. And then, yeah. and then you could, and then yeah. you're at the bottom of the hill, the black, whatever it is, black diamond world, world champion ski. And you're like, oh, <laughs> shit, I just did it. but yeah. Um, oh, I lost my train of thought, but I love this concept of peak. Per- oh, here it is. When also, when I talk to peak performers and this happens to me in the operating room, Sometimes when we get into a place where we just think we can't move on, right? I will never be able to get healthy again. I will never, or this is a an acute, highly stressful situation. Um, we have the agency or the opportunity to say, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Uh, looking backwards, I will never be as good as I once was. Or, oh my God, oh my God, I'll never get where I think I can be. Peak performers talk about staying in the moment, time stands still, like you're at the top of the mountain, right? It probably gets really quiet in your head and t- it's a little slow. This is what happens to me in the OR and the most difficult part of the case. ORs are kind of loud. People are doing their jobs around you. But when I'm in a peak performance state, it's very quiet in my head. Time stands still. Lots of peak performers talk about this. And then they say, instead of panicking, And looking back or panicking and thinking I'll never get there in the future, they say something like, I was made for such a time as this. (laughs) Because I believe that I can be somewhere that I cannot see. So anyway, it happens to health too. I don't mean to get all weird on people, but you may think you can never get into a place of peak performance or optimum health. It is not true. Not true. I see it all the time. See it all the time. You People, 50s, 60s, 70s. It yeah. just, you know, it requires a conscious effort. I'm, I'm not saying it's easy. And you just like roll out of bed and it happens. It was you know, easy. Everybody it. would be, right? But yeah. <laughs> um, you mentioned um, something about alcohol. Um, oh, you said right. that you don't drink alcohol anymore. Drink what, anymore. What's, well, what's that about? To quantify that, yeah, I don't, I was never really good at it. Uh we didn't grow up drinking in our homes, but you know what? I was in grad school and we'd enjoy wine with my friends. And, but I, uh, stopped drinking all together last summer for a couple reasons. Uh, lots of aging gurus are bringing this to the forefront, but you know, we used to say things like, uh, alcohol kills your brain. And mm-hmm. then after that, 
because you get one brain, right? We used to say <laughs> alcohol kills your brain. You get one set of cells. They don't regenerate. Well, then we found out brain cells do regenerate and you can build more. So the conversation went away a little bit, but the conversation is very loud now that even one drink has devastating effects on our brain. Mm -hmm. And, you know, David, even despite the, you know, the people who, who talk about, well, five ounces of red wine or 1.5 ounces of hard liquor or a beer, it's okay for your heart. It may be okay for your heart, but the research is clear for your brain. So that's the, that's mm -hmm. the first reason I have stopped. And if, and I realize that it's cultural and, and it's, again, it's an observation. I'm not judging. It is an observation. Mm -hmm. You make your choice, but I cannot spare one brain cell. Number two, there is also clear data that when we think of lifestyle choices that affect cancer risk, mm -hmm. that that uh, alcohol has a profound life uh, increase in cancer risk for breast cancer, mm -hmm. you know, and if I'm fighting so hard to get my mitochondria in shape and, and decrease fat, which is another risk factor for breast cancer, then why am I going to gum it up with, I can be, I can be enjoying my friends in a different way. And those are just the choice I made, but completely backed by research. I'm not making it up. Right. I've had several people come on this show and tell me exactly the same thing. Um, and uh, people that are, you know, experts in dermatology and neuroscience and re all the whole range. And they've all told me alcohol plus brain bad. Yeah. Uh, and I, and I think that like, once again, we're in one of these things where people are saying like, you know, it's okay. Oops. Go on my earpiece. Um, that it's, you know, it's okay to have like, you know, three to four drinks a week or something, it, it, you know, you've seen over the years how it's sort of scaled back. It was like, oh, two to three a day is okay. And then it yeah. was like two to three a week. But uh, like the people in the know, they're just, they're telling me like zero um, is optimal. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and not that this is a measure of success, but, but many health gurus who are public about their journeys um, have said the same thing. Yeah. I've read it. Yeah. So um, it's interesting, though, when I talk to people about it, it seems to be something, you know, they draw the line, I cannot give up my two glasses every night. And you know okay. what, it's not overnight, uh, yeah. you can decide to do that. And, you know, I don't try to move a mountain, but at the same time, I'm going to maximize their mitochondria and make them lift heavy weights. So I'm going to, I'm going to yeah. help them with every other thing, right? You know, if you're having two glasses of wine and you go to bed, I can guarantee you at two in the morning, yeah, you're going to, yes. you're going to pop wide awake and you're going to yeah. wonder why that is. <laughs> well, and that's the other thing. And, and I'm not a sleep expert, but I've listened to a lot of them and alcohol knocks you out. It does not help you sleep. That exactly. is a right. I'm sure you know more about that than me, but just because you're knocked out does not mean that you're resting. Well, and, and you, you, your brain goes into rebound. So you, you know, that's why like, you know, two o'clock in the morning, um, the, with the effect of the alcohol has worn off and you, and your brain rebounds and suddenly you're like wide awake. Wow. Look <laughs> at all the things I got to think about right now. Well, <laughs> oh, um. Um, well, uh, I, I love these conversations. Um, the, I just want to end with, you know, when, when your patients come to you mm -hmm. and they, you know, they're looking for a higher degree of health or peak performance, like, People can get really overwhelmed if you yes. if you say, "Here, do these seventy things yes. in the next yes. twenty four hours." I think how do you how do you meter that down into like a manageable, actionable number of things? You know what I start with first, David. We spent and people are surprised by this, but I spend the first session or or as much time as it takes helping them understand why why are we striving? Why mm. do we want to be? not just healthy-ish, but optimally health. What is the reason? Because we all know that people start and fail diets all the time because there is no why. And putting mm -hmm. on a black dress is never going to be enough, right? Six weeks later, you're back to where you were. So we spend a lot of time. Why do you want to do this? Who are you? Is this consistent with who you are? Let's ask people who know you. You can say you are this or want to do this, but is it true? Because we tend sometimes to not be authentic. And then, so we create a vision. 
because that will then give meaning to the otherwise meaningless things we do, right? So that's number one. Number two, I start with a very simple panel that includes a set of general, what's your liver doing? How's your albumin? Are you generally, is your nutritional status generally okay? We're not cachectic, right? Or because even heavy people can be malnourished, right? People don't realize that. But so we do that. We look at baseline inflammation, uh, several values of inflammation. I look at um, lipids, ratios of, of uh, LDL, HDL, triglycerides. And if there's a problem, then we get the LDL particles. So we know what that is. And then, um, so those are three categories. And then I do check intracellular NAD uh, to know energy levels. We know that in young people, intracellular NAD levels are about 20. And when I first tested mine, it was, I mean, it, it, young people's are about 80. When I first tested mine, it was 30. I've now, I use a supplement uh, by Genfinity Labs that uh, I'm up to about 50 now. And I feel the difference. I mean, I really do. So we work on those four things. I do not draw 8,000 biomarkers. You can, if you want. But I find after 25 years of taking care of people, people are really confused. And so if I do three things, we're going to work on three things, and then you're going to come back and we're going to add another one because we've taken care of this one. This is now a lifestyle. So that's why I go in steps. And I prefer to work with people over a six-week launch, and then we can decide how much more time or if we do this continuously. But um, we start simple, David, because it's too confusing. But I think data is key. I know you love data. You track your data because you can't do what you don't know. I, I, I had a surprise once. I was 48, 49. I went in for my yearly physical mm -hmm. and they said, wow, your platelets are, I think my platelet level, I mean, they're about 220 now. They were um, um, somewhere around like 40 or something. And they're like, Wow. Oh, that's weird. And they said, wow. hmm, maybe you better come back. And I, so I, I came back like a couple of weeks later and they were like, they looked at the labs and they said, we want you to go outside very carefully, get in a taxi and go to the ER because they were, they were like 10. They were like, wow, like scary, um, you know, like, yeah, don't fall down. From, yeah. Don't fall down. Don't fall down. And so I run. I run my stuff every quarter because mm -hmm. I don't want that. I don't want to have that surprise again. If something's right. going on, I want, I want to know about it. And so I can take care of it. Right. And you know what I tell David, because someone's out there thinking, well, who pays for that? Well, you probably do what I do. I pay for it. I pay for what I want. I bug my doctors or I write my own scripts until I get what I want, because yeah. I feel like we should, we should pay if we, if, what the insurance companies say we can get does not mean that's what we need, right? No. So, yes. <laughs> it's exactly. just what they want to pay for. It's right. I just need. want to clarify that for people because people yeah. think that what they say is what you need. <sighs> so I encourage people, instead of buying the $2,000 fancy purse, let's invest that in our health, not yeah. our accessories. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Um, pay me now or pay me later because- the, the later is really, you know, I, I mean, I spent a year in a hospital. You don't want that. Um, oh my very gosh, uncomfortable. Yeah. 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 So, um, Dr. Vonda, you are awesome. I love talking to you. Thanks for having me. And I am so, uh, um, amazed and, uh, envious of your skiing. Oh, <laughs> I don't, I, so, okay. I just want to level set here. Oh. So <laughs> we're, we're up on the hill and there are two courses. And the one on the left is the 16-year-old girls course. Uh -huh. But this is Park City. So yes. they're offspring of Olympians and probably future Olympians. And I'm watching them and I'm thinking, oh my God, like, how is that even possible? And then there's us, which is sort of <laughs> like a very, very different sort of skiddy, awkward thing versus these like bullets going down the hill. So yeah, we're not that. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? Peak performers like you see things that are not seen and you are at the bottom of the hill when you get down. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still in the game. You know, well, still in the game. 
Um, Dr. Mon, if people want to get in touch with you, what should they do? Yeah. So I am on Instagram at, at DR Vonda Wright. So you can find me there all the time. And I've been putting a lot of funny little videos, information packed. You can almost you can also email me at Vonda at Vonda Uh and yes, I just did give you my email address. That's fine. That's what it's for. And then I have a website, Dr. Vonda Wright, all consistent to see what I do from a surgical perspective and from the other side. Um, I, I'm hoping I never see you as a surgeon, um, yes. but if I do need a surgery, uh, if, if I, if I do need a knee or a hip, um, you're, you're who I'm calling. <laughs> well, it would be my honor, David, but socially, not medically, as I say. <laughs> okay. Um, wonderful to speak with you again. Thank you so much for having me. Take care. Bye-bye now. It was great to have Dr. Vonda on, you know, my, my takeaway on that is that there's a lot that we can do. We have a lot of control over our health span, if not lifespan outcomes, but it requires a conscious effort and it requires, you know, sort of a plan, which leads us to the segment of the show that we call Try This. And this week on Try This, I think we're going to take a little page out of Dr. Vonda's, what her thoughts are on alcohol, which you know, we've heard on this show that with increasing frequency that, you know, any amount of alcohol is not so great, especially for your brain. So for try this, you know, we're not going to do this like dry October or dry January or, you know, if you're used to having a glass or two of wine at night, maybe this week, let's just try this and maybe don't do it and just see how you're sleeping. Maybe you sleep better. Maybe you don't wake up in the middle of the night. Maybe it has no effect whatsoever. Maybe everything is the same. Maybe you feel better in the morning. Maybe you feel the same. Maybe you feel worse. I don't know. Just try this. See how it works out for you. Thanks for joining us on the show today. We really appreciate your time and attention, and we hope that these shows are valuable for you and that maybe you pick up a thing or two that will improve your health, your happiness, and maybe your lifespan. If so, maybe you can leave us up to a five-star review wherever you're listening to this show. You can also leave us a comment. We love those. And what we would really love is for you to share the show with some of your friends because that's the only way we grow. If you want to contact me, David, superage.com. I answer all of my email personally and promptly as I can. Next week, we're going to have another great show. Everyone, have a wonderful week. It's great to have you with us.